I'm going to play you a couple more that were from shows also. Um, and, and what I found was particularly w with Mr. Melville, with Mr. with Mr. Anderson, I would take the facts and try to present them in a way that was more lighthearted or less, less antiquated than he can be, he can sound, let's say. And uh, that, that, was a, that was a little decision on my part. I'm not putting them down. It just didn't seem to uh, work when I did, literally did what he said. Sometimes I'd use lines, okay? Uh, uh, and I had an experience with the, uh, that song I played, Spoon River, uh, was I had written that originally for a show uh, when I was about 25 and uh, uh, the reason I wrote it was because I had encountered the Spoon River poems and I didn't think it was possible to set those poems to music because they were so free verse and they were so, you know, they just didn't have the normal bounce of calls. But I was listening to the radio one day and there was an interview with Aaron Copeland and he said, uh, they said to him, Mr. Copeland, do you ever set poems to music? And he said, no. He said, I, he said, I, he said, I don't set poems to music if they rhyme. But if they free, if they're just free, then I'll set them to music. And they said, well, why? And I was, me too, man, I'm driving along going, why, why, why? And he said, because, uh, uh, because uh, when it has, when it rhymes and it has beats, you know, I think that I shall never see a poem of, you know. Uh, he says, when it has beats, then it's taken, it's taken care of the music. For me, he said, it's just filling in the blanks to make a song then. He said, but if you can, if you come up to something that's prose, doesn't have, doesn't have even uh, uh, beats to it, uh, you can have a good time musically, and you can justify the effort uh, that you've made to set it to music. And this was a, this opened up my head a lot. Although I didn't believe it at the time, I thought, oh, he's, you know, he's, he's being, he's being too abstract. You know, truly, the ones that work are the ones that rhyme. Yeah, but. But as time went by, I came to see, uh, because I experimented a little with it, okay, I went back to the Spoon River poems that I thought you couldn't set to music, and it was no problem. Not all of them, you know. But once I looked at it like saying, this is a little challenge, uh, uh, it was cool. So then I discovered you could take whole pieces, paragraphs, and set them to music. Okay, and that that was exciting because again, it was always something that I read where I thought, "Wow, this is beautiful." You know, it's, this has a flow to it. And I'll and I'll play you one where where uh, uh, the, there's no there is no meter in this at all. It's a paragraph. It's prose, but I think I got it into a song, and I didn't add anything to it at all or subtract anything either. That was part of the game. Okay, was putting it down, reading it just the way it was on the page, and then saying, this is going to be, and some of you are probably going to go, you know, well, I can see that, you know, duh, it didn't work, you know what I mean? But, uh, but some of you will say, well, that works very well, and part of what makes it work very well, I think, is that it's unpredictable. It's from Grimm? This one I'm going to play for you isn't from Grimm, it's, I'll, I'll explain. Young lady lived in uh, the early part of the 1900s, her name was Opal Whiteley, and she had a book out about 1925 called The Diary of Opal Whiteley. And uh, uh, she, they questioned whether she'd written it, because it was so beautiful. Uh, she said she'd written it when she was seven, and it was so gorgeous. They said, no, 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 you, you wrote it when you were like 25, clearly, you know. And uh, uh, there was a lot of controversy. It was a bestseller. So uh, the, the funny thing is, you know, I'm 75, and when I look at the seven-year-old, the 25-year-old, there's not a big difference. <laughs> I mean, they're way in that far range, you know. And you, you write this when you're seven, you write it when you're 25, it'll make a difference, you know. The point of it is you are exhibiting some sort of genius. And I read this paragraph and I knew that this was just too cool. So uh, this is the seven year old girl. Now are come the days of brown leaves. They fall from the trees, they flutter on the ground. When the brown leaves flutter, they are saying little things. And they whisper of the hoods they wore then. I saw them, I used to count them on my way to school. Today they were talking of the time before their morning days of this springtime. time. 
They talked on and on And I did listen on To what they were telling The earth and the trees In their whisperings They told how they were a part of earth and air before their tree warning days and now they are going back to gray days of winter they go back to the earth again but they do not die And in the morning of today it was that I did listen to These talkings of the brown leaves Talkings of the brown leaves Opal Whiteley, seven years old Uh, so now I'm going to do some help Melville, and this, so the Opal Whiteley was a situation where I found exactly, uh, this entire paragraph, I'm not going to mess with this. This is going to go just the way she wrote it. Uh, but the one with, uh, with Herman Melville, uh, it was more, there were phrases that I loved. And so I made it, I made a kind of rule that I wasn't going to use a phrase if he didn't. Okay. So... Uh, he, he, uh, I gotta get a capo up right there. So I found in him uh, phrases that, uh, uh, that worked, and I just had to uh, rearrange them so that uh, they, they sat next to each other in a reasonable way, or I had to take out sometimes, I would remove a phrase in the middle so that it would, it would, play for a uh, for, as a song but man it, I was surprised by Moby Dick I always kind of dreaded getting near it and, uh, uh, and, and it like a lot of things like Thomas Wolfe it reads sometimes just like it was written yesterday you know there's a, there's, a, there's a freshness about it and you forget that it was you know 1860 or whatever 1880 mm -hmm. So this is a, a story from, from Melville, and he, he, if you ever go near Moby Dick, you'll see that it's comprised of a lot of little stories in a certain way. written her husband a letter in a woman's penny hand it is sorely tumbled and damp with mold from months away from land Mr. Harry Macy Ship Jeroboam that's Poor 
fellow, poor fellow, and from his wife, why it's Macy and he's stark dead. Why it's Macy and he's stark dead. persuaded five men to man his boat in the sperm whale fishery so full of furious life he forever sank into the sea Mr. Harry Macy ship fellow and from his wife why it's Macy and he's stark dead why it's Macy and he's stark dead Thank you. Oh, what's our time like? I know I've been we're going along. Take, take a few questions. Okay, that's a good. That's a good suggestion. What a what a good suggestion. Anybody want to go anyplace that I can that I can assist? No questions. So we're done with that. I'll do one more song. Yes. And you were talking about if you don't like it, you're going to fix it. Yes. It's like that's ownership. It's like ownership for your life. Ownership for your songs. Yeah. Yeah, it's the outcome it's. Yours. Pardon me. The outcome is yours. The outcome is yours, and and the thing is, well, I should tell you about that fixing things. What I find is is that I heard this thing from John Prine, which I thought that's this is real accurate. He said, "You go back to it a few days. The words that don't that don't fit fall off the page. They slide off the page." And I have had the experience of writing a song not knowing where to go, abandoning it, coming to it a year later and going, "Oh, of course, duh." Yeah. You know, I mean, it was so clear. It was so clear that then, but it wasn't clear then. So what I've discovered is every day there's a little something that you get you didn't have. It's it's the ruminating on the tune, and on the, not just the tune. I mean, the whole song ruminating on the song, and then uh, going and looking at the words again and saying, oh, I see. You know, and uh, and you have to have that frame of mind though, because and you and I think, as I say, you can't let it set. You know what I'm getting at here? You can't let it set into one way and then think you're going to take care of it. That, that's hard to do. That's hard to do. Because I've certainly had songs that, I, you know, 20 years ago I wrote them and I look at them and go, oh, oh, something's wrong with that. i got to fix that. You know, I mean, it's so full of unfortunate whatever, you know, verses, tire verses that I would never sing now. Uh, uh, not just because I'm old, but because I have thought about it a little bit. Uh, uh, so I think uh, uh, you have to keep, churning up the, the earth. And, that, and the way you do that is, you put, as I say, you write it, look at it the next day. Look at it the day after that. Look at it the day. And just think, what, what do I want here? What do I want here? How is it falling short of what I want? What can I add to it to make it closer to what I want? Et cetera, et cetera, okay? And the, you will answer the question different days. Yes? I, I think um, that's kind of the key, and I learned this from you many years ago, is people ask, when, how do you know when the song is finished? Oh yeah. When you can't find a word that you're willing to give up, yep. And you can't find a word to be added. Yep, exactly that. Your song is done, and you're yeah. pleased with it. Yeah, yeah. And you taught me that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate yeah. you remembering that. And that is that is the case. The thing is that you that you you know how do I put it? So many people who start writing songs, the first thing they want to do is it's like they don't even examine this. The first thing they want to do is play it for somebody else. This is not a good idea. <laughs> you know, it's not a good idea. It's only in the movies where you get up and you're playing a new song and everybody's looking at each other and going, oh, he's so good, you know. Uh, because really what, what happens when you play a song in front of somebody, their first, their first uh, uh, motive is they feel as if they have to come up with something. 
well, I don't know, that sounds a little too much like da da da, da or you sure you want to do the thing with the, or I didn't understand that, you know, all that stuff. The things that people do say in constructive, because you're playing it for them. How do you like this? You're asking them, how do you like this? What you're asking them is, if you wrote it, what would you do? That's what you're actually asking them. That's how they take it. So don't play it for them. You know, when you, you know, I'm getting out here, just don't play your songs for people with the expectation that they're going to comment. Because com the comments, by and large, will not do you any good. And I'll tell you, man, I've had negative comments from people when I was 15, I still remember. Yeah. You know, I wake up in the middle and I go, oh, you know, and, uh, uh, and so you just, you don't offer, it's like, is my child pretty? That's no, you know, you don't want to do that. <laughs> You know, you, you, you just don't want to do that. You know, you're, you're working on something here, you're gestating something here, and you may decide two days from now that you hate it. That's cool. The thing is that, that you, you're the one that looks at it, and you're the one that knows what you want. Okay, you're the one that knows what you want. You have to ask yourself constantly, what do I want? What do I want it to sound like? Who do I want it to sound like? You know, how can I make it sound the way I have in mind? How can I make it sound a way that will please me? And uh, the other suggestion I have is, is and then we'll close, uh, uh, is uh, record yourselves. Record yourselves. It's later than you think. Record and yourselves. Listen. Yeah. And listen back. So like, you like listening to anybody else. See, and I do that with the third person. I go, that guy needs to do this. I wish that guy wouldn't hit that note so hard. I wish that guy would, uh, would slow down here. I wish this guy would uh, play longer before he starts to sing. I wish he would play faster before he starts to sing or, or get over the instrumental quick, quicker, you know. He doesn't need to have this verse. He, doesn't, he needs to have a chorus here, etc. And I do it third person you know, because it, it's just like anybody else I'm hearing on the, on the radio. It's just me. You know, I'm listening now. I'm standing back and listening. I'm not doing it. You know, when you're doing it, that's an entirely different mechanism. To listen is, you know, what I tell myself is, I'm writing a song that I want to listen to at night. And I will listen to it at night. And if it doesn't work, I will rewrite it and try to listen to it tomorrow night. And there was some point where I'll say, I like listening to this all the time, just the way it is. Okay, there, that, now we're done. Thanks for bringing that up. That was good. Okay, we're done. Thank you very much. What a pleasure. Too much. Oh, stroll, I see, yeah. All right, that's good. All the way from Chicago, please welcome Michael Smith, everybody. You know. the Newark Stark ledger the other day. I see your old college steady Melanie made the front page of the Newark Star ledger the other day. Shot her husband William McGuire, chopped him up, dropped him into Chesapeake Bay. See her driving down to Chesapeake, dropping Bill off near and far. See her driving down past Echo Keek, dropping Bill off near and far. Kind of like Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden had a car. <laughs> hey, Melanie McGuire, what you doing there with your three suitcases? 
full of bill Hey Melanie McGuire What you doing there with your three suitcases Full of bill Got him demonstrating Samsonite Quite against his will Aren't you glad that you didn't marry Melanie? Only to dwell in three valises by the sea Aren't you glad that you didn't marry Melanie? Only to sing help in three-part harmony Hey, come on, every time she came near Didn't somebody whisper Timber in your ear You drive down to Aquakeek You better stay in the passing lane drive down to Echo Kick to see your friend Grace, you better race there in the passing lane. They say that Bill McGuire's hitchhiking tonight in the pouring rain. He wants to get himself together, get himself together, get himself together again. himself together, get himself together, get himself together again in the pouring rain. Dutchman's not the kind of man to keep his thumb jammed in the dam that holds his dreams in. But that's a secret only Margaret knows. When Amsterdam is golden in the morning, Margaret brings him breakfast. She believes him He thinks the tulips bloom beneath the snow He's mad as he can be But Margaret only sees that sometimes Sometimes she sees her unborn children in his eyes Let us go to the banks of the ocean where the walls rise above the Zyder Sea Long ago I used to be a young man And dear Margaret remembers that Dutchman still wears wooden shoes, his cap and coat are patched with love that Margaret sewed in. Sometimes he thinks he's still in Rotterdam. He watches tugboats down canals and calls out to them when he thinks he knows the captain. Margaret comes to 
take him home again Through unforgiving streets That trip him though she holds his arm Sometimes he thinks he's alone And he calls her name Let us go to the banks of the ocean Where the walls rise above the side Remembers that for me Whiskey keeps away the dew He sees her for a moment Calls her name She makes the bed up Hum and some old love song She learned it when the tune was very new He hums a line or two They hum in the night The Dutchman falls asleep and Margaret blows the candle out. 